Going from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my partner, the Professor Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's on tap today, Lou? Matt, the story of our lives, day late, dollar short. How many mistakes did we make over the last couple of years in putting together a podcast, producing the podcast, bleeding money from the podcast? We're having fun. But it would have been wonderful to have a guy like Jason Sircone with us two years ago to hold our hand through the process, explain to us the do's and don'ts. But as we always do here on the Liquid Lunch, the audience benefits. So audience, big round of applause to Jason Sircone, guest and founder of the Evolution of Brand podcast. Welcome, Jason. Gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to do my best to get you up to speed. I'm sure well, you yeah, obviously caught enough. up and learned a ton over the last couple of years. So we'll see hey, what Jay, I can do for you. Why do people start a podcast? I think it's a tremendous way to connect with your audience. And I think a lot of people see this sexy side of it, that starting a podcast could potentially pay you millions of dollars. Look at Joe Rogan, right? And you guys can attest. Once you get into this, it's fun. It's rewarding, but it's a lot of work. And you, you really have to be committed to it right from the start. And that's something that I take pride in letting people know up front. If you want to do this, yes, there's a lot that can be gained. You can really gain some traction with the evolution of your brand, no pun intended. But you really have to understand the time commitment that goes into it. And you have to be patient. Podcasting's a long game. If you do it right, you can win. You know, I think they say the average podcast... Er, only records like five or six episodes. Yeah, it's like yeah, I've heard that. That's like six, seven, eight. It's in that. It's a very low number. It's in, it's in, just insane. But then again, eighty percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. So <laughs> also true. So how did you? Um... Hey guys, but that can be said about all small business. How many people start up small businesses and six months later there's sure. there's dust trap. So, Absolutely. you know, it, it, I, I think every business, whether it's a podcast, you have to treat a podcast as a business that has to be a test of time. You know, Jay, we're going to lift the hood for you. Matt and I have a day job. Our nine to five is Shield Advisory Group. So the Liquid Lunch podcast started up, frankly, as a joke because Matt knows I'm, a, I'm an introvert and he goes, I'm going to get this guy to come out of his shell. So we started doing the podcast and we realized that by educating the populace and our audience and our clients, uh, there there is a certain resonance, right? But no we don't do we don't podcast for money. We podcast as the branding and the marketing medium for our company. But here we're trying to teach people: if you're going to do a podcast, how do you monetize it and how do you brand it? So let's really roll up our sleeves and give some salient tips to the audience. Well, Luigi, I think you nailed one of the most overlooked ways of monetizing your podcast is putting so much value in front of your audience that they build trust in you and they come to you for your primary service or your primary product. A lot of times people are thinking the only way that you're going to be able to monetize a podcast is to get some huge sponsorship or to get advertisements that run on your show and could potentially dilute the value of your show because if you're just peppering ad after ad and, and beginning, middle, end, and your audience tunes in and says, what the hell's happening? This is nothing but advertisements. I don't want to listen to that. Then they tune out. So you have to be very diligent in how you build your show. So yes, you can you can include advertisements. And you, you can do sponsorships. But as I mentioned when we first got started, you have to be patient with your growth. And if you expect to grow your show, you have to do it on the back of your content. So if your content is peppered with ads, it's going to be hard to gain traction because a lot of people will tune out because there's just too many ads. I know when I watch a television show that seems like it goes to commercial break every few minutes that I'm out, I'm, I'm going on to something else. So those are some strategies that you can think about. But again, it's all about doing it the right way. A recommendation I make to anybody is to find some affiliates in your niche, in your industry, 
that you can partner with and use those as advertisements because an affiliate commission is going to pay you much more than just running an ad that gets put in with the dynamic ad placement that your host might offer you. So you might have a, a insurance ad or a cell phone ad or something that has nothing to do with what you're doing. It's just inserted. It pays you pennies on the dollar. But if you have a product or service that someone that you're partnered with can put, put an ad together for you, or you do a live read to recommend it to your audience, put that in front of your customer. I'm sorry, put that in front of your audience. They may resonate with that. They may make that purchase. And then you get an affiliate commission that will pay you far more than any type of advertising, unless you have thousands and thousands and thousands of listeners, which most people don't at the very beginning. So you have to be smart about it and putting a product or service in front of your audience that they can utilize is huge. But Luigi, you said it perfect. I, I podcast for the same reason. I want people to build trust in me. I want them to get to know who I am and they I want to hear them or I want them to hear me have communication with great guests and have phenomenal conversations and then turn to me for advice, help, maybe pay me on the back end. So that's really what it's all about. Jay, when someone's starting out, do you recommend that they outsource their production or should they bring everything in-house to try to manage their own quality? Really depends on the amount of time that you have to devote to the project and if you have the staff in-house to do it. If you can keep it in-house, that's a great thing. But if you want to outsource, that's also a possibility. Really just depends on what kind of time you have. And I've worked with people that have outsourced right from the start. I've worked with others that have wanted to learn it themselves so they could have a better understanding. Maybe they never intend on doing it themselves, but they understand what the process is like so they can have an understanding and tell somebody, this is what I'm looking for. And I think that's a rule of thumb with outsourcing as a whole. If you have a clear picture of what you're looking for, it's much easier to reach out to somebody else to help you do the work, but you can give them a blueprint of what you're looking for. So the final product you get in return is to your liking. So it really just depends on the bandwidth that you have in your world. And if you feel that somebody else can do a better job than you, absolutely bring them on. And whether you keep them in house or, do it on a, just a contract basis, it's going to help your cause. You know, over the last almost two years now, I think we've actually put out about 75 to 76 episodes, right? And we still have a ton left that we haven't even produced yet to go out. But you've been doing this a lot longer than us. So you've been doing this going on seven years now. How did you get started? Because you really started in the infancy. <laughs> it's a funny story. I, I did radio back in college and I loved it. And lightly tried to pursue it after college and it just didn't pan out. And when podcasting started to become a thing, I was getting a little bit more interested in what this medium was, but didn't have a lot of thoughts about doing it until my best friend and I were talking and we were just for months started kicking like, what if we do a podcast? What would we talk about? We're thinking about what we were passionate about, football, sports, pro wrestling, beer, like these all these things that we were like, what do we do a podcast about if we're really going to do this? And at that time, I had launched a website called Breaking Brews here in Pittsburgh. And the idea was at that point, this was 2014. So the idea was to get people to have a further understanding of what this craft beer movement was all about. I think in 2022, it, you probably think of that and just laugh because everybody's drinking this beer now. But in 2020, or, I'm sorry, in 2014, it was a little different. So I wanted to start a site that provided some education, had some advocacy, and really told the story of what these breweries were trying to do. So I did that. And along with it, I launched an app and I started making some partnerships with some people around Pittsburgh. And the app was designed to promote events and, and happenings and, re and beer releases, all these different things. And people could get the information right to their phone and then they could attend these events if they wanted to. And it was, again, the early buzz was pretty good. And out of nowhere, when I first launched the app on day one, I had this guy start trolling me on Twitter about how I was doing everything wrong and all of this was terrible. And I don't know how you think you're going to make this work and blah, 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 just tearing me down. And I was conversing back and forth with them. I had never really experienced a troll before, <laughs> and especially on that level. And finally, I'm like, what the hell does this guy even do? And I go and look, and he had a beer podcast. So I texted my buddy. I'm like, we're doing a beer podcast and we're going to do a lot better than this guy. So two weeks later, we started a podcast and we absolutely did not do it as good as that guy. We were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, it was brutal. 
So but how did that how, how did that start? Did you just, did you go to Best Buy and buy some mics? You Amazon, Amazon baby. Amazon? We, we, yeah, we did. And this is the thing. Like when I talk to people now, is that you can benefit so much from how I effed up in the past because we did no planning. We didn't think about niching down. Like, well, if we talk about beer, that's cool. But maybe we'll talk about sports too. So now all of a sudden we're in two different directions before we even recorded episode one. We went on Amazon. We got some mics. We got a mixing board. We did our first episode from a noisy bar. So we had that going on. We did no editing. We threw this piece of garbage out on the internet and we had a podcast. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I look back on that and cringe. But also I look back on that with great fondness because it reignited this passion that I had for audio. And I knew I was doing something like I knew I just felt great. I felt alive behind the microphone and I knew I wanted to pursue it, but I wanted to get better. And we ran that show as far as we could, had a lot of fun, met some great people. It did open up some big doors for us. And then when I, when my buddy and I, we just decided, well, you know, life's just getting in the way. We're not able to record with the same frequency and we shut it down. I started a second podcast on my own and probably got into about the 20th episode. And that's when I realized, you know, this is going well, but I want to take some time to just get better at this craft. So pulled the plug on that show and just took a year and a half to study. And when I was, I mean, I, I put on an analytical cap and started listening to other podcasts, listening to radio personalities, watching TV and like analysts and weather people and interviewers. How are they conducting those interviews? How are they communicating with the camera? So their message was w w well relayed to the audience. There was really a lot to that. So I ran with that, like I said, for a year and a half. And then I decided, okay, I think I'm ready. And I jumped back in and I was much more comfortable and I was much more successful. Fast forward a little bit. I had a friend reach out to me to help him start a podcast. And that was really what got the ball rolling because it instantly hit me. I could help others do this too. And I was still working in the beer world at that time, but then the pandemic hit and my hand was forced because I had come into that year coming into 2020. I was thinking about what can I do to pivot to this full time? But at the same time, all the work I was doing with the marketing and sales and the beers, I was going really well. So I didn't want to pull the plug on it completely. But when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, I was forced to make some changes. And that's what I did. And I've been running with it ever since. So how, how do people engage with you? Like, how do you help them out? Is it one-on-one -on -one coaching? Is it through a course? Is it how? It really comes down to, again, I go back to what I was saying before. I think this might have been said before we turned the mics on. This is a pretty applicable skill to anybody that's building a brand. It's just a question of how you want to pursue it. So I offer strategy sessions where we can talk about what your goals and expectations are. What are your thoughts? Like, what do you have in mind for building this podcast? And if they have some good ideas, we can build on those. Or if they come to me completely fresh with, hey, listen, listen you tell us what we should do. I can lay out a blueprint for them that fits their brand. So there's that side of it. And then I created a program called Guest Accelerator. And I focus these days mostly, I mean, I will still do consultations for people that are looking for help with their own podcast, but I like to help people build their brand as a guest on podcasts because there is a lot less work. You can get your feet wet, learn about this medium and get comfortable with your voice and become more confident. And in doing all of that, you're going to build a skill set that will serve you in a number of different areas, but you may fall in love with the platform and say, you know what? I feel much better about this now. I'm going to start a podcast from this angle. I know a little bit more now. And I also have some skills and some connections from these interviews where I could bring these people onto my show. So I built a program that trains people how to maximize their time as a podcast guest, because many people will treat it very transactionally where they'll just go on a podcast, talk for a little bit, and then they're done. And then when the show goes live and nothing happens, they wonder why. And it's because they're missing a lot of opportunities on the front end. They're missing opportunities during the interview. And then they're doing nothing to put that interview in front of their audience once it goes live. So it further deepens people's belief and trust in them. So this program walks everybody from A to Z on how to get better at being a guest so you can actually profit from it and gain clients and bring more people into your orbit. So Jason, we like to get pretty technical here, right? So can you give us three tips that you would give your, your students to be great guests on some podcasts? Absolutely. Number one is never go into sales mode. 
You're not there to sell. Your job as a podcast guest is to provide value, to have a very compelling, captivating conversation with the hosts, because that end product, if it helps people in a number of different ways, whether it changes a perspective, whether it gives them a nugget that they can apply to their own practices, that's what's going to impact them. And that's what's going to make them build trust in you. So if you, if you spend the whole time going in sales mode and just saying how great your product is and how great your service is and how great you are, that's going to turn a lot of people off. And more than likely, they won't even get through the episode. And that's if the episode even goes live, because a lot of hosts will hear that type of talk and know that their audience isn't showing up for that. And they'll never air that episode. So sales mode is a bad thing. Second tip I would give is to be consistent. Don't show up and do one interview and then do, don't do anything for another three or four months and expect to be better and expect anything to happen. You have to get better at your craft. You have to put in the practice swings. I, I've been golfing since I was seven. So practice swings are natural. If you're going to get better at something, you have to put in those reps. And if you're going to be a good podcast guest, you have to flex this voice. So get on the mic, tell your story, have these engaging conversations. And you can't just do that once a month, once every few months, you have to try to do at least one interview per week and then build on that. And the more comfortable you get telling your brand story and connecting with other podcasters, the more you'll want to do this. So doing things consistently, you're absolutely going to help your cause. And the third big tip I tell everyone is not to expect immediate results. Podcasting is a long game, whether you're a guest or a host. And the great thing about most podcasts is it's evergreen content. As long as podcasters aren't taking that content off the internet, it has a chance to serve you a year down the road, three years, five years down the road. You can gain business because you're putting relevant content into the world that's going to constantly serve you. And as new people discover these podcasts over time, they're going to hear your message. When they hear your message, if that resonates with them, they're going to take the next step to connect with you. So as long as you leave a call to action that leads back to your website so they can make that connection, you're going to be in a great spot. So these, those are three tips I would say. Write those down in stone. We're never changing those. Jason, you've got a wonderful history in radio and your elocution is excellent. Thank you. Do you have any sort of tips for whether you're a podcaster or a guest? Is it Sally sells seashells at the seashore or do you do the <laughs> Dore Mi Faso Latido? <laughs> you want to hear that this is so stupid, but it's, it is what it is. I have two vocal exercises that I do before I do my podcast or before I do an interview. I do the lines from Anchorman that Will Ferrell does in the opening scene with the arsonist has oddly shaped feet. It's stupid. I know, but it just, it's funny. It makes me giggle. I, I Let's do it. Let's do it. I want to hear it. Do it. The arsonist has oddly shaped feet. The human torch was denied a bank loan, you know, things like that. <laughs> and the other thing I do equally is stupid. And this, I, I don't think I can do this on the mic. You guys are going to make me do it. I know it. The crash test dummy song, the mm, you know that it, it's no, how's, song it for, how's that go? I don't remember. How's it go? I just see. I knew you. Uh, I think that once there was this kid who now I have a much more <laughs> deeper voice, so I will absolutely do that to warm up my pipes. Totally dumb, but you have to do something that makes makes it comfortable for you. It makes it fun. But it and, works, Jason. You've got a voice like Wolfman Jack. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, much appreciated. I just made myself. No one has any clue who Wolfman Jack is. Forget I, it. Well, if you want to, <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, this isn't something that happens overnight. And I've had that compliment so many times. And it just made, I just recently jumped into voiceover work because of that very reason. So many people are like, you have a great voice. Have you ever done voiceover work? And I just finally said, I'm like, I'm missing something here. I started focusing more on it when the more people were saying it, I wanted to develop it. And Roger Love, who is probably the world's most renowned voice coach, I picked up his book and I got his audio book as well. And I was going through that. I'm still going through because I go back to a lot of different lessons. And he made me realize that there was the section about all these different flaws in your voice that you may not be realizing are even happening. And I'm listening to it on the audio book and he's talking about how your voice might break or your voice might go high or your voice might go too low or you just all these different things. And the one flaw that when he said it, it hit me right in the face was sometimes my voice would get gravelly almost to the point now. Like I, when he said, it, I'm like, okay, I can fix that. Now I know how to fix it. 
So now my voice doesn't come across so gravelly. So much so, it's I buried it in my head. It's so hard for me to even imitate it and go back to it. So it takes work. And again, this is one of those things that if you're going to put in the, the reps, you'll develop these skills. And then you can take these skills and apply them to a number of different areas in your life. Are these physical skills? Like, do you change the, the movement of your mouth and your tongue? How, how do you stop being gravelly? It's enunciation. For me, it was in the throat. I would I was discovering that what would happen was I would have some phlegm build up in my throat. I would still be trying to talk, but I would let it build to a point where I wasn't even thinking that it was making the voice come across gravelly. So like, okay, now I have to be cognizant of it. If, I'm gonna, if something gets into my throat, I'm going to need to stop and clear my throat. I think I'm quoting a rap song now and <laughs> make sure that doesn't come across in the microphone because I'm trying to create a pleasant experience for anybody that hears my voice, especially when I'm narrating a book or doing a video or, or doing some type of ad movement or, or ad read, whatever the case may be. I want people to enjoy my voice and actually say what you said, Luigi. It sounds great. It sounds like Wolfman Jack. What do you think about people that, maintain their geographic accents and intonation. Like Matt tells me when I get a little bit emotional and upset, my inner Brooklyn comes out. <laughs> it's authentic. There's nothing wrong with it in my opinion. I mean, I feel that, you know, I, I, I believe we share the same heritage. So I always have a soft spot for the Italian rhetoric and the, the, the accent, but I, I feel that you have to be authentic and own your voice no matter what it is. Now, you can practice skills that are going to make it better, make it more clear, make sure that you're enunciating properly and, and getting your message across, but you can't try to fake it. It's almost when I think of that, I want, if you guys remember the show House on Fox with yes. Hugh Laurie, yeah, I think well. it was like the fifth season I realized I saw an interview with him. Like, why is he talking with a British accent on this interview? <laughs> he is British. And he, and that's what I, I had to do some digging. I'm like, I had no idea. I had no clue. He did that American accent so perfectly. He had me fooled. I had no clue he was British. And then I realized like, to me, I'm like, okay, so obviously he, he made that work, but I feel that in normal settings, you have to be authentic with everything you're doing and your voice is included in that. If you try to fake it and get away from that authenticity, I feel like it dilutes your message to some degree. You know how many actors are British that you would never know oh, <laughs> until I know. they start talking? Yeah, the guy from Sons of Anarchy was another it's one. Every time. Um, Charlie Hunnam. I was like, wow, okay. No, you yeah. know what really threw me off? Superman is British. I thought the guy was from Kansas. Which what? <laughs> which Superman? Or is, oh, you're, oh, is that a joke? Did I fall for that one? No, the I don't know his name, but the the, the good looking, handsome guy that was the the, the most recent Superman. Uh, I, I do not follow. Uh, yeah, well, I was thinking Christopher Reeves when you said that. I'm like, <laughs> that's what I was Reeves. thinking too. <laughs> that's where my mind. I don't, yeah, I don't follow on. a lot of those superhero franchises. So, like, <laughs> Batman's mine. That's the only one I really pay attention to. So, what's what's next up in store for Jason Sircone? Where, where, where are you taking your podcast? Well, I have recently expanded, I, I, well, probably eh, six months ago at this point, maybe seven, I expanded to two episodes a week. And a lot of that was based on demand. I've had a lot of people that have wanted to be part of the show and it's allowed me to expand the content. I may be going to three. I've been flirting with it. I've had a few weeks where I've collaborated with some people and done appearances on their shows and then had them on mine. So I'll release those a little bit early as a thank you. And those weeks, I typically release three episodes. Now I'm in that mindset of, do I want to start doing this three times a week? And I made a commitment when I first launched Evolution of Brand. I'm coming up as we sit and record today towards the end of September 2022. It's almost a year old. Year anniversary will be October 26, 2022. And I made a commitment that for the first year, I was going to do everything myself. I didn't outsource a thing. I've been doing editing. I, I wanted just to keep it close and make sure that I was building it the way I wanted. And then I said, after a year, I may reevaluate this and start talking to some people about editing the show or doing the show notes for me or whatever the case may be. And I'm getting to that point now where I might, if I go to three, I'm probably going to need to bring in some help. So I'm going to keep building on that. And I have an idea that I'm not going to share here because I haven't said out loud, but if it ever comes to fruition, I will reach out to you guys first and tell you that I did it. 
and you can bring me back on and we'll talk about it in length because if i do it and it works i think it's going to be game changing but Jason, that's, not things works, like buddy. that's not the way it works matt and i have a, have a theory <laughs> whenever we really want something we throw it <clears> out <throat> there in the universe and yeah. the universe boomerangs it and brings it right back to fruition what are we doing podcast franchising i'm going to leave it at that Woo-wee! hey jake I like if it. you're dealing with a new podcaster Mm-hmm. And he or she is not sure on how to make this work. Do you recommend that they start with a weekly, a daily, a bi-weekly? And if so, are there any days that you found resonate better with launches? I will. I'm going to flip that on its head, Luigi. I would, anybody that's coming into this brand new, not knowing the best direction to go, the first thing I would recommend to them is to become a guest first and do not go down the road of starting your own show. Because what ends up happening a lot of times, you buy equipment, you, 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 some people go too far and think, oh, I got to have the state of the art equipment. So they're spending thousands of dollars on setup and mics and mixing boards and all these things that certain resources or certain gurus will tell you you need. But then they get a few episodes into it and they're like, eh, this isn't for me. So now you're trying to offload that equipment at a loss and you really don't need to go down that path until you start reaching out to some podcasters and saying, look, this is what I do. This is my specialty. If you're looking for guests, I'd love to connect with you. Let's talk about how this can work. Start making some guest appearances on shows that are relevant to your mission, your message, and your objectives. Once you do that, you're going to get comfortable with your voice. You're going to get more confident in your delivery. And then you can make that decision. And you may say, look, this guesting approach has been great for me. I'm just going to run with that. Or I love podcasting so much. Now it's time for me to start my show. Now you have some experience under your belt. And now you have some connections that you've made from your guest spots to where you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm launching my show now. How would you like to be a guest? So you can get the ball rolling in a great way. So that's the first thing I would do. So let's assume, to answer your question, Luigi, that someone has now reached that point. They've done that initial guesting. They've gotten comfortable. They're ready to start their own show. I recommend weekly. Now, I know you can go bi-weekly, but the reason I recommend weekly is because it allows more opportunities for you to flex your pipes, to really put in those practice swings that are going to make you better at your craft. So focusing on trying to do a weekly show, and if you have time restraints, don't make a two hour bi epic or biopic podcast episode that's going to take forever to take care of in post production. And end of the day, it, it just burns you out because you're putting so much effort into it. Keep it short, keep it concise. Try to shoot for about 30 to 40 minutes because that's about the general range of a typical podcast episode. Some do go longer, no doubt. Some are even shorter than that. But the sweet spot's probably in that 30 to 45 minute range, give or take a few minutes here and there. And when you get into that zone, that's going to set you up for much more success because you're building something you can manage. And at the same time, you're getting better at each and every crap or each and every interview you do. It, it's strengthening your confidence. So do all of that. And especially at the beginning, batch some content. Do a few episodes in advance so you're not putting yourself up against the wall from the very start. Because if you come out with one episode and now you got to do it the next week, you may not have the groove yet. So I recommend everybody get at least 10 episodes in the can before you launch your podcast. That's going to put you in a better position to win. And you could launch a few episodes right from the start. Give your listeners something to really sink their teeth into. You put three episodes out there, it's more than one. And now they can get addicted to your show and keep coming back week after week. So Jason, for your own podcast, do you run any marketing for it? I do a lot of organic, mostly. I mean, I've run some ads here and there. I think the next step for my marketing, if I'm going to pay for it, will be to advertise on podcasts and to advertise on podcast platforms versus social media. Reason being is social media is great for awareness. It's great for some conversation. It's great for planting seeds. But I don't think most people, when they're on their social media accounts, scrolling through their feeds or scrolling through TikTok videos or reels or whatever the mindless activity may be at that moment, are in podcast mode. Therefore, if an ad pops up in front of them to come listen to a podcast, they're more than likely not going to jump off of that scroll, come over and listen to your show. It would have to be the most engaging, impressive piece of content to make somebody change their habit on a dime like that. But what you can hope for when you put those types of 
put that type of content in front of people is that they say, Ooh, this looks good. I'm going to commit this to memory. I'm going to go listen to this podcast when I'm on my way to work tomorrow or when I'm at the gym. And for me, I'm thinking that if I want to attract podcast listeners, I want to hit them where they live. And if I'm advertising on other podcasts or on podcast platforms, I'm 100% guaranteed to be hitting a podcast listener. So the likelihood of them jumping from that podcast over to mine because they like what they hear is a lot higher than trying to pull them out of a scroll hole on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. So that's where I would do it. And that's where I'm probably thinking about the long-term plans of my advertising. But I've been experimenting with a couple different things in regards to organic, just doing some recaps of my episodes and things like that. And I don't think I've officially landed on what I want to run with full time, but we'll see what happens next. Jason, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, can you tell the audience where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you? 100%. I appreciate you guys taking the time to speak with me today and to have me on your show. I love what you're doing. And everyone can find me at jasoncircone.com. I have a guide that I put together to get you started. It's called Eight Simple Thing, Eight Simple Ways to Grow Your Personal Brand with Podcasting. You can pick that up for free, jasoncircone.com slash free guide. Everything's on my website. So if you want to connect with me elsewhere or check out my podcasts or learn more about how I can help you be a better guest, it's all at jasoncircone.com. Matthew, before you take us home, Jason. I got one personal question for Jason. Yes, sir. Warm day. We're at the beach getting kind of hot we have one choice of craft beer what are we drinking oh warm day at the beach i'd have to go ipa i i mean that's that's my jam in regards to beers so i'd probably be going to something like a i mean here in pittsburgh big it's a big ipa town so there's a lot of good local choices but i'll go with fat heads headhunter that's that's a good beer drink. or sierra nevada pale ale Either one of those on a nice warm day are always going to be super crushable for me. Done. Jason, your favorite podcast. Can't say yours. The Liquid Lunch Project. I, I'm on it. I, 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 I took in a couple of your guys' episodes. I'm like, yeah, I gotta, I'm going to have to tune into this. I, I love the content. But I can't remember the gentleman's name, but the interview you guys did about the music industry. I think it was one of your more recent releases as we sit and record. Mr. Paltrowitz. He's a music stud. Yeah, that was some good, that was good stuff. But I, I think that I would think the, the one that's influenced me the most is Entrepreneurs on Fire. That's one that I still go back to. And especially when I recognize the name, I, I've been fortunate enough to have several of the guests that have also been on that show appear on mine. And I pulled some of what John Lee Dumas has built into his show and included it in mine just because I felt like the, just how clear and concise the messaging is. It just makes sense. And for me, I'm all about getting my audience to the value as fast as possible. And that was something I learned from listening to his show. So that's probably one of my favorites for sure. Jason, thank you so much, guys. That's a wrap of the Liquid Lunch Project. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Lunch Project.